I hope it doesn't bother anybody if you stay behind the pulpit. I talk when I'm on the phone. There's no way I'm standing still for this. <laughs> Several years ago, uh, my family, the Grace clan, if you will, uh, had a family reunion at Kennywood Park. There were like 27 Grices, three different generations all running around, if you can believe that. Kind of scary, I know. But whenever you have a big group like that, what happens invariably is as soon as it hits the park, everybody scatters and does their thing. And because apparently when you're at Kennywood Park, no one can look at a watch, somebody has to gather them up in order to get them back together for lunch and dinner. And on this day, for whatever reason, that somebody was my brother Ted and me. So we're going through Kennywood Park, rounding up Grices, sending them back to the pavilion. Uh, and of the 27 Grices there that day, we had found 26 of them. <laughs> there was one missing, my daughter Emily. And we've been looking for a little while, and I was kind of in that spot that I think most parents will recognize, where I was a little bit past concern, but I wasn't yet into the alarm stage. And so we're walking through that section that's kind of ironically named Lost Kennywood, looking for my daughter. And Ted is telling me a story about how they had brought a group of their students from Bell Vernon High School to Kennywood for what they called a physics day. They taught them how all the different rides worked. And I was probably about half paying attention to him. <laughs> And he must have known that because all of a sudden he sort of rounds up in front of me and says, well, like this ride, for example, how do you think it works? And I stop and look, and we have come to stop at the ride that's called the Pitfall. Now, I'm happy to report the Pitfall is no longer at Caneywood Park. But in case you missed it while it was there, let me describe it for you. The Pitfall is an amusement designed by a psychopath for the sole <laughs> intention of scaring people who have a death wish. <laughs> now admittedly, if you looked on Kennywood's website, that wasn't the description they gave. And you might think from my description that I have a fear of heights, but that's not true. I have a fear of dying. I have a respect for heights. <laughs> anyway, of all the rides we could have stopped at, I'm, let, let me, it, is, it is a tower that goes 157 feet in the air. It was at the time the highest point in Kennywood Park. And it had these these seats that go around it. And if you choose to ride it, you sit in one of the seats, and as soon as you do, they tie you down so you can't get away. <laughs> they call them safety harnesses, but they tie you down so you can't get away. And then this magnetic clip grabs you and pulls you to the very top where they dangle you for a while so you can visualize what death by plummeting looks like. And then they drop you. The theory being that somehow before you go splatter on the pavement, the ride's gonna stop you. And as you can probably tell by the way I described to you, I'd never ridden this ride. So of all the rides we could have stopped at, you know, this is like the worst. I think my exact words when Ted said, how do you suppose this works, were, I don't know, and I don't care. I'm never riding it. He goes, no, how do you think it stops? I said, well, I don't know. I'm assuming that it has some kind of braking mechanism, you'd hope. So it's probably like a brake of a car, maybe, like a dr brake drum. And Ted said, no, couldn't do that. That could fail, which, by the way, is why I never wrote it. <laughs> I said, well, I don't know, maybe he has like springs or something. And he said, do you see any springs? I said, okay, Ted, I give up. How does this ride stop? And I'll never forget, he literally held up one finger and said, it uses physics. <laughs> That's like telling me it uses magic, you know. <laughs> I said, I don't even know what that means, Ted. He said, okay, I'll explain it to you. And I'll use small words. He said, there's a track that rides up, and up on that tower. And the ta track gets progressively thicker as it gets to the bottom. It's laminated with copper and brass strips. Now your seat has a copper coupling that rides on that track. And because it's made of copper, as it goes down, it generates friction, which in turn generates static electricity. And since it's getting thicker as it gets to the bottom, it is calculated, it has generated more and more static electricity so that by the time you reach the bottom, it has generated so much static electricity, it brings you to a stop almost like on a cushion of air. And he sums all that up by saying, isn't that cool? And I said, I don't know, why is that cool? He said, because it can't fail. It's not based on electronics or mechanics, so it can't fail. It's based on a principle of physics. It'd be like gravity failing. You could literally take some of the top of the pitfall in a driving rainstorm, drop them, and just as you drop them, you shut off all the power in the park, and they would still stop. I said, all right, that's a little cool, I admit. And then we went back to our search. And that would be the end of my story. Except, about an hour later, I found myself getting strapped into the pitfall. <laughs> now, I know what you're thinking. Wait a minute, you are making such sense a minute ago with all that dangling thing. I know, right? But uh, in my defense, I can only say uh, I was tricked. 
See, I had a nephew who was all depressed, or at least acting depressed. I literally like dragging a tub in the dirt, you know, and, oh, what's wrong? Oh, Uncle Mark, no one will ride my favorite ride with me. I said, dummy me, without first asking him what his favorite ride was. I said, I'll ride it with you. You know, what is it? Thunderbolt? Steel Phantom? No, it's the pitfall. So I've made several blunders at this point, but I, and I made the biggest one next, because if ever you had to ride something like the pitfall, don't ever ride it with somebody who told you it's their favorite ride. For one thing, I think we can agree their judgment is somewhat suspect. But beyond that, they know things about this ride that other people don't. Like, for instance, the pitfall was built overlooking a hill. And not just any hill, it's the first drop of the Steel Phantom roller coaster. Now, why would that matter, you say? I'll tell you why. If you ride the pitfall on that side in Oh, by the way, we did. Uh, you'll find that when you get 15 feet in the air, you suddenly lose track of the ground it was built on, and you find yourself looking down the entire length of that hill. So you're only 15 feet in the air, and suddenly it feels like you're 150 feet in the air, and you have just started your climb. When that ground dropped away, and I'm looking down this thing, I don't, I don't know if you've seen the movie The Princess Bride, but there's a scene with the Cliffs of Insanity. That's what this is like. It's like, where did the ground go? I'm suddenly already higher than I've ever been without wings or a parachute. And this is wrong. My palms start sweating instantly. And, and I, I feel this tightness in my chest. And it doesn't help that I'm tied down so I can't move. And so I'm looking. I'm trying not to panic. And I'm having a very hard time breathing suddenly. You know? <laughs> my breath's going in okay. Just nothing's coming out anymore. It's a, <gasps> And we're going higher and higher. And my, my nephew turns to me, of course, because he's right beside me for this whole thing. He wouldn't want to miss this. And he says, Uncle Mark, look up. I'm thinking, OK, that sounds like good advice, because looking down is clearly not helping. <laughs> so I look up, and we haven't even gotten halfway up yet. I think, <laughs> dear God, forget about dying on the way down. I'm going to be the first person dying on the way up the pit. <laughs> this is a long time to go without breathing. So we finally get to the top. When you get to the top, you kind of swing a little bit. And everybody screams. And my nerves are already shot. I don't need this. I would have screamed with them, except for the fact, of course, I couldn't breathe. You need to breathe to scream. But as we kind of, s then, then the worst thing happens. They actually have this, this, the metal clip thing that's holding you makes this click, click, clicking sound, and nothing happens. <laughs> this is how I know it was built by a psychopath. They're just messing with you at this point, right? But as I'm hanging there, I suddenly have this real strong clarity of thought. I mean, my mind is focused like a laser beam. Like I haven't had it focused in a long time. This is kind of a remarkable experience as I'm hanging up there. Because my mind has focused like a laser beam on three words. It can't fail. That thing that Ted told me, which was mildly interesting to me when I was standing on the ground, <laughs> became the focus of my whole life while I was hanging above the edge. It was like a mantra repeating over and over in my mind. It can't fail. It's gravity. Like gravity, it can't fail. It can't fail. Over and over and over. And then my nephew, who has blessedly been quiet for a while, suddenly turns into mission control. Okay, Uncle Mark, we're going to drop in three, two, one. <laughs> and he knew this right well. As soon as he said one, we dropped. And I couldn't scream because, you know, there's a whole I wasn't breathing thing. But if I could have, I would have screamed on the way down one more time, it can't fail. Somewhere between heaven and hell, between the earth and sky, between life and death, Physics kicked in and brought us to a remarkably gentle stop. And that would be the end of my story. Except, as fate would have it, I would re relive the whole thing about six months later. I wasn't in Pennsylvania. I didn't relive this physically. In fact, I was in Texas at the time. It was very strange because I relived the whole thing while I was praying, believe it or not. But what happened was, I had just recently come back from visiting a friend who was going through a hard time. And I had gone there for the sole purpose of bringing them comfort movies or TV, there's always that one guy who can say the right thing to break the mood or, or comfort everybody. I wanted to be that guy. I, I, I'm never that guy, by the way, for whatever reason. I always think I should be. You know, I think I'm personal friends with the Prince of Peace. I should be able to bring peace wherever I go, but it never works out that way. And this was one of the situations which was even worse than usual. It was like, I don't know if you've ever had this, where you're trying to comfort somebody, it's like your words turn to stone and just thud to the earth, you know. And I just felt useless and helpless. And I came back and I was praying, which is my way of saying I was complaining to God. And I was kind of blaming him because I thought, you know, you could have given me something to say. And uh, I'm in the middle of making some what I thought were pretty good points uh, to God when he interrupted me by asking me this question. Mark, do you remember the pitfall? 
And I'm going to tell you, just like that, I was back. I could see it. My palms started sweating. I could feel the tightness of my again. It was like I was there, and I didn't like where this was going. I said, uh, Lord, I do remember the pitfall. What makes you bring that up? And he said, well, I had you go through that then so I could teach you this now. And I remember the, just the impact of that kind of stunning me into silence. You know, briefly, it's me. But stunning me into silence. And uh, I kind of got excited then after that because I love stories with the moral. I said, okay, you have my attention. Tell me, what's the moral of this story? Why did I go on the pitfall? He said, do you remember how before you got on the pitfall, I had your brother Ted tell you all that stuff about physics? I said, okay, I distinctly remember him telling me that, about physics up until this moment. I didn't realize he was a messenger from you, but yeah, I remember. He said, suppose he hadn't. Suppose you had got on the pitfall without ever knowing how it stopped and gone all the way to the top, and there you are dangling at the top, trying to remember how to breathe. And at that moment, Ted walked to the bottom of the pitfall, megaphone in hand, and said, don't worry, it's physics, you're fine, nothing's going to happen to you. Would that have done you any good at all? I said, no, Lord, in fact, if he had tried that, I probably would have taken off my shoe and thrown it at him. <laughs> he said, right. And then God said the second thing, and he said three things to me, like in, in a space of a three-minute time period that blew my mind. The second thing, which was the moral of the story, he said, that's because the things you pay attention to when your feet are on the ground are the only things that can bring you comfort when you are hanging over the edge. Now that took me a trip up the pitfall and six months to learn, so I hope you don't mind if I repeat it. The things you pay attention to when your feet are on the ground are the only things that can bring you comfort when you're hanging over the edge. Now when I first heard that, I kind of thought about it. I misunderstood it. I said, wait a minute, Lord, are you saying that because my friend wasn't paying attention to you before, you won't help him now. And God said, does that sound like me? And then he said the third thing that day that would blow my mind. He said, Mark, if you could see for your life what I can see for your life, you'd never be afraid. But you can't. And when you get into these moments when you're scared, when you're so frightened that you have to remember how to breathe, there's nothing that I'm going to say or anybody's going to say that's going to bring you comfort. In that time, the only thing which can possibly help you is that which is already inside of you. Which I know kind of makes it sound like a bad parody of a Gatorade commercial, but what is in us? Because that is what matters. You see, pressure does not change us. Pressure reveals us. It comes and it squeezes us from all sides, and whatever is inside of us comes out. So what's important is what's inside of us. The Bible puts it this way in Philippians 4.8. It says, finally, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good report, if there is anything virtuous, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Now, I've read that verse before, but somehow I never saw the verse that came after it until after my trip on the pitfall. He said, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, in other words, when you were with me, the things you were paying attention to, these things do, and the God of peace will go with you. This is the same peace he's referring to in the previous verse where he's saying, he describes the peace that passes understanding. So what we've meditated on and what we've put inside of us is what brings us peace when we're hanging on the edge. Now I know that there's a possibility that as I'm here right now preaching, there are some people in this room who are hanging on the edge. You are here in body only. Your mind and your spirit are a million miles from here working on some problem in your life that just won't let you go. And if that's you today, I apologize because I know the sermon came too late for you. But if you're with me today, if your feet are on the ground, I have a message for you. The edge is coming. Probably not where you thought I was going with that, but the edge is coming. How do I know that? I know that because we live in a fallen world corrupted by sin and the edge is always coming. Sometimes bad things happen to good people. In fact, sometimes bad things happen to people who aren't so good, but bad things happen. Don't believe me? Jesus in John 16.33 says, in this world you will face tribulations. The edge is coming. I don't know what it's going to look like for you. It's different for everybody. It's different in every season. Uh, maybe it's a relationship that you counted on that's gone. Maybe it's a job that you needed, which is suddenly taken. 
Maybe it's a diagnosis from your doctor that you never saw coming. I know the edge is coming. I don't know what it looks like. And I know that in that day, the only thing that is going to help you is that what you're paying attention to right now. And by that I don't mean me. I'm just some guy talking for 20 minutes. Then you're going to get on with the rest of your life. I mean the rest of your life. I mean as you leave your day and you go home today, tomorrow, the rest of the week. What gets your attention? I mean if you walk into your room, what magazine book is on the bedstand. If you walk in your living room, pick up your remote, click on the TV, what channel comes up? Or if you're really bold, hit that last channel button. Now what channel comes up? Or maybe you have one of these. These are great. I have 64 gigabytes on this thing. I could put almost every song I know. And it has a little wire I can put in here and I take one of them, I stick into this ear, and I take the other one and stick into that ear like I've jacked it straight into my brain. And I can listen to it wherever I go. Running, you know, riding a bicycle, on a bus, while the preacher's trying to talk. <laughs> this is the soundtrack of my life. Maybe you have one of these. Have you ever taken the time to Google the lyrics of the soundtrack of your life and checked out what those songs are programming straight into your brain and what has your attention? I have. It's a depressing kind of exercise. And I don't know about you, but... Um, I wonder how many of those songs are excellent, pure, lovely, true. Or put another way, how many of those songs are going to help you when you're hanging over the edge? I mean, to be honest with you, if I'm hanging over the edge and a Lady Gaga song comes on, I'll probably jump. <laughs> or maybe go into your computer room and pull up your internet browser, hit on that history button and check out all the websites that's had your attention for the past week or month. How many of those are excellent and pure, true, noble, just, praiseworthy? How many of those are going to bring you comfort when you're hanging over the edge? Now we got to this part in my sermon and I was kind of preparing it and I said, Lord, I hope that when I get here no one thinks that the purpose of the sermon is to say that the only thing you can do is listen to Christian music, read Christian books, and do nothing but Christian websites. Because I don't believe that's what Philippians is saying, and I know it's not what I'm saying. Just for the record, I believe that the God who created this universe in all of its variety and color never meant for his crowning creation to live lives of black and white. That being said, though, I also believe there's a big difference between what we read, hear, and see and what we meditate on. And that's what we're talking about. What really gets your attention? What are you writing on your heart? What are you meditating on? When I was in school, in grade school, I, I know a time ago, we had a phrase that we used to use um, called off by heart. They probably don't use that anymore. But I remember the first time I memorized my address, I was in first grade, I couldn't wait to run in and tell my teacher, I know my address off by heart. Right? Or if you knew a poem and you know, recited for the school, you know, the class, and do you need to read it? No, no, I don't need to read it. I know it off by heart. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about what you know off by heart. And it's actually good news. In fact, there's some good news here and there's some better news here. The good news is that what we're not talking about is meditating on your navel for 20 years until you reach a state of nirvana and then you'll have peace or dropping, facing a certain direction and bowing seven times a day, or getting the right combination of crystals together, or the right chant, or some of junk that the other pseudo-religions try to teach. What we're talking about is touching the things that touch God. And the really good news is the best way of doing that is through God's Word. Now, I know maybe some people think, well, that doesn't sound like good news. That sounds hard. But it is good news. It's really good news. And I'll tell you why. Because God's Word is powerful. It's almost incredibly powerful to the point where we can't even describe it. So let me try to give you an illustration. Now I'm going to get a little geeky here. I'm going to talk about some science and some math. Kind of go all Sheldon Cooper on you for a minute. But stick with me because it pays off in the end. The most powerful thing we've created as a society is the nuclear power plant. The largest one of these generates 5,000 megawatts of power. Doesn't matter if you know what that means, just know a small part of that would power a submarine. A lot of power. We only have about a dozen of those in the world today, but suppose we had more. In fact, suppose we had a lot more. Suppose we created 2.5 billion of these nuclear power plants. And suppose you 
somehow gather up all the power from all those power plants for a full year. Do you know how much power you would have? You would have the same amount of power as is generated by our sun every second. And here's where it gets good. Our God created that sun with his word. He didn't use his hands. He didn't use pieces. He didn't use anything. He simply said, let there be a sun to rule by day and a moon to rule by night. And it was so. That is a powerful word. It's so powerful, God said once, when I send it out, it never comes back to me empty. That's powerful. This is the power of the word that has made the lame man walk, the blind man see, and the, ra- the dead come back to life again. This is a powerful word. It's so powerful, it almost doesn't matter where you get it, and you don't need a lot of it to bring you comfort when you're hanging over the edge. To illustrate this, I'm going to close with a story that's a true story, although this one didn't happen to me. This happened to a friend of a friend of mine. He's an Assemblies of God pastor. And he had started his church as a prayer meeting in his home, about eight people, and it grew. And when they had a group of people who were sincere, they got seed money from the Assemblies of God Church. They bought land, they built a church, and the church grew and the church prospered. In fact, they had to have a building uh, expansion and they grew some more. And it was a very prosperous and influential church in the community. So at a very relatively young age, this man had pretty much everything he'd ever wanted in life. He had a job that he loved. Could not wait to go to work every day. I don't know how many of us can say that. He had people that he cared about and cared about him. He had a family, married with two little kids he just adored. He had everything. But the edge was coming. See, his wife had an affair with another member of the church. And when it was discovered, instead of repenting and going back to their spouses, they took off together. Literally in the middle of the night, she took the kids, they left, and they filed divorce from another state. The man was, of course, devastated, but it wasn't over. You see, both of these people were well-liked in the church, and people being people start sticking up for their friends. And before very long, a rift was starting in the church as everybody kind of took sides in what was happening. Now, the Assemblies of God denomination has a policy when something like this happens. They come in and they remove all the leadership in the church. And in the Assemblies of God church, everybody's a minister. It's a minister of music, minister of teaching, you know, minister of youth. And they remove them all. And they bring in brand new leadership. They believe that's the only, th- only way they can possibly get the church to the point where it can heal. Which probably makes sense for the church. But think about this poor man. I mean, he went from having everything to having everything taken from him. His job, gone. His family, gone. The people that he cared about, he wasn't allowed to talk to anymore. The Assemblies of God Church came to him and said, look, we're going to move you out of the neighborhood so the church can heal. And we're going to send you to you know, some psychological counseling because we know this has been hard on you. And when you get through that, when you've healed, you know, we'll find you a new church and you can start again. Now, I don't know if you've ever been anywhere near where this man must have been. I haven't, but I experienced a small part of it. When I was 40 years old, I went through a divorce. And I can remember that there were some evenings when I would sit down to a tasteless microwave meal that I made myself, and I could not remember a thing that happened that day. I remember there were nights my eyes would come open and I'd be staring at the ceiling, too tired to get up, but unable to sleep. Those nights lasted forever. It was like a black fog just kind of followed me around. And it was a very dark place. I don't know if you've been through that. I pray to God no one ever goes through that. But it is a very dark place. And because that's just a small part of what this man went through, I somewhat understand what he decided to do next. I don't condone it, but I get it. You see, he decided he didn't want to start his life over. He wanted his old life back. And if he couldn't have that, he just didn't want to live. He was a hiker and he knew of a spot where the kind of path curved and there was a rock that jutted out over top this ravine 500 feet down to rocks in the river below and he decided that was how he was going to do it. He was just going to end his life. So he drove his car to the cutoff spot, left a note on the dash to tell everybody what he was doing, left the keys in the ignition, he had no need for the car anymore, and he hiked out to that rock. As he kind of skittered down the hill to it, he got on it, he put his feet down on it foot hit the rock, the thought went through his mind, on Christ the solid rock I stand. 
And he kind of laughed because it was his favorite hymn. He thought, you know, I don't want to end my life angry with God. So as kind of a way of making peace with my maker, I'm going to sing this hymn one last time. So he sat down there on the rock, legs dangling over the 500 foot ravine, and he sang this hymn one last time. As he got to the end of it, he thought of another hymn that he really liked. So he decided to sing that one too. Kind of went from the one right to the next. And we got to the end of that one, he thought of another, and another, and another. He sang for hours. Until his voice was hoarse from singing and crying until the sun had long since set and until he finally had the courage to crawl off the rock and start his life again. The things that you pay attention to when your feet are on the ground are the only things that can bring you comfort when you're hanging over the edge. Now the edge is coming. The only question is today what gets your attention? Would you pray?